Thank you, Ling Jin, uh, for your kind introduction. And uh, I would like to also thank uh, the uh, meeting organizer, Josh Kuhn, uh, Ling Jin, and many uh, other uh, students uh, here to put this uh, great opportunity uh, for us to interact. Uh, so I, uh, this is the first time I came uh, I, for uh, medicine or UW. Uh, so I guess when I uh, came out of this uh, airport, I already filled <laughs> red everywhere in the jersey, so I put my red sure uh, to be part of this <laughs> atmosphere. And the previous uh, speaker, uh, uh, Si gave a gr great talk, so put me in a lot of pressure. And uh, you know, you, we have to lower down the bar a little bit. I'm uh, going to talk about the, uh, the multi-omics analysis review, um, a large number of uh, uh, glycopeptide uh, from uh, the global and uh, fossil proteomics and their associ with, uh, association with uh, uh, tumor subtype uh, and uh, uh, glycosylation enzymes. So uh, when um, when we read a uh, glycoproteomics paper or glycosylation paper, generally you will say in the introduction part there are few sentences. Often you are not miss. Uh, one uh, you know generally started uh, glycosylation is one of the most common pro uh, protein modification, not necessarily post translational modification. Called any glycosylation is a co uh, translational modification, and the glycosylation play. Um, essential roles in uh, cell uh, function and um, aberrant uh, glycosylation is often associated with uh, uh, pathological conditions like disease um, and uh, biosynthesis and the regulation uh, of glycosylation are complex uh, are, uh, and also less understood. Um, uh, Therefore, the comprehensive analysis of glycoprotein is essential to understand the function, structure and function of glycosylation. So with all this uh, saying in many introduction, you can actually uh, realize or um, the, the reference supporting this uh, claims uh, and a statement are uh, fairly uh, sparse. In saying that this, this area actually uh, are still in the, um, I will say infantry in the uh, technology development and the further advance uh, to understand all those, uh, you know, uh, statement uh, mentioned in most of the review or, uh, you know, papers uh, in the introduction part. So, um, this, I put one of the, in terms of a glycosylation function, I put uh, one of Jerry Hart uh, review in the cell uh, to show that the glycosylation actually plays essential role in a biological uh, function, uh, including uh, cell differentiation, uh, adhesion, uh, different, uh, interaction, and uh, like it, um, and uh, a receptor uh, interaction, and infectious disease, like as you talk with uh, the cell surface, uh, you know, um, uh, in, uh, interact, uh, like uh, bacterial and virus interaction with the uh, host. And interestingly, there are like another type of glycosylation was uh, discovered uh, originally by Jerry Hart uh, group, uh, that's old, old group neck modification actually play a role in uh, uh, cell uh, signaling. And uh, so uh, uh, glycosylation uh, plays its uh, functions uh, actually through all kind of different uh, glycosylation. If you think about the glycosylation is uh, one type of modification, actually the reality is uh, like a thousand or tens of thousands of different modifications. Each glycosylation actually play uh, different roles. In general, it like, can uh, like subclass uh, the glycosylation in five uh, category. Uh, one is uh, the protein glycan, the protein modified by by polysaccharide, uh, then uh, the GPI anchored uh, glycos glycoprotein and glycolipid, and uh, um, the um, oak glucanic modification intracellularly, and uh, um, the uh, oligo uh, oligosaccharide modified uh, protein, uh, including ending glycosylation and olding glycosylation. So those are the uh, two uh, type of modification I'm uh, going to focus on today. Many ending glycosylation recently were also actually invest on uh, the, um, uh, the development of a analysis uh, method for olding glycosylation. <coughs> So those are the three topics I'm going to uh, focus on today. One is uh, the glycoproteomics workflow. Glycosylation uh, is, uh, uh, I will say, if it's not the most common, it's a very common protein modification. 
and uh, glycol addition is associated with uh, ovarian cancer subtype. So actually, due to the time uh, limit, I actually took out 20 slides right before this talk uh, to to get us uh, on time to the uh, dinner. So these are two uh, type of glycol solution I'm gonna focus today. For example, this is inter in the cell surface or extracellular surface or secreted protein. The uh, protein are often modified by uh, N and O link glycol solution, even though they modify by uh, like other modifying GPI linker or uh, pro uh, the polysaccharide. Those are two uh, modifications that are very common um, observed, especially with advance, uh, advancement of technology recently, and we see more of the common modification in uh, most of the proteins. So, um, you know, next few slides I'm uh, going to introduce of, uh, the several um, uh, approach we're uh, using uh, to analyze the glycoprotein. One approach, like Lindsay mentioned, when I was uh, working with Ludi so to develop what uh, we call chemo enzymatic approach, um, enzymatic approach to analyze ending glycosylation site containing peptide. So the approach uh, inc uh, includes the conjugation of the uh, gly glycoprotein through glycan to the solid phase. This is a chemical reaction. After the uh, conjugation, the non glycosylated peptides are released by uh, um, in a proteinase. This is an enzymatic uh, like a reaction, and the um, ending glycan are released uh, from the uh, solid phase for mass spectrometry uh, identification and the quantification. So in this case, uh, we have a um, you know the uh, chemical uh, conjugation, solid phase conjugation step, and two step of uh, enzymatic re uh, in, uh, like reactions to allow the specific um, you know, capture and release of ending glycosylation site. Since then. Um, we have applied this method in uh, investment of uh, uh, different disease uh, and also uh, in the community, I many other uh, labs actually use the method. So uh, in recently, one of the postdocs in the group actually um, accumulated um, the protein identified or glycosylation site identified through this uh, ending glycoproteomics approaches. From the 2003, uh, the time when we published the first paper, 175, ending glycosylation site identified in the database. So far, we have accumulated uh, to have uh, like over 14,000 14, 14, ending glycosylation site identified. So uh, through this, we also can investigate the um, protein uh, commonly expressed in multiple uh, tissues or cells, and they're overlapping with a body, for, for example, serum or urine sample to determine what are the uh, specific, uh, actually, the proteins that can be detected and can be used uh, to detect certain um, uh, tissue-specific uh, uh, changes. And uh, um, so, in that uh, particular approach, um, so uh, when I was uh, um, in the, uh, attending the first glycosomics meeting organized uh, by one of the great uh, glycobiology, like um, Tanaguchi in Japan, I realized that you know the, everyone actually analyzed the glycan. In this approach, actually, we release left the glycan uh, on the bead. Uh, you know, we thought uh, further investigate this. So since uh, um, you know. Um, Joy, uh, Johns Hopkins, so we tried to investigate the glycosylation uh, part of it. Even in initial publication, we focus on the ending uh, glycans or holding glycans by conjugating the uh, entire peptide to the uh, solid beads and uh, modify the, uh, the carboxy group uh, from salic acid to uh, neutralize the negative charge, also uh, give a higher hydrophobicity, and in the same time, uh, like, stabilize uh, the lipo uh, salic acid. Um, when uh, the uh, glycoprotein or glycopeptide are still on the beads before the glycan are released for the mass spectrometry analysis. Using this approach, we can identify hundreds of uh, um, glycans from the, from the, uh, the we call uh, glycomics approach. But uh, we only published uh, this type of approach uh, for one year, 2013. We quickly realized that this glycomic approach has its own limitation. Since the uh, glycan release from protein, we lost the source of the, uh, the uh, where the glycan came from. Many cases that uh, when we investigate antibodies or, or other, even a very, uh, actually, uh, specific proteins, really we can actually receive a, a high, uh, 
purif highly purified proteins. So in this case, the glycan actually analyze this way actually came from um, multiple or, or mixture of uh, glycoproteins. So in in this uh, you know uh, in this uh, you know observation, we actually further investigated to determine whether we can investigate the glycosylation a specific uh, glycosylation site. This actually paper is our first um, attempt uh, to try to investigate or identify the glycan on specific proteins. This is GP120 protein, which actually we uh, we purified uh, in the higher purity. We now exactly the glycosylation site. So we can see all the, uh, the over 24 sites can determine by the spec method like as described uh, in published 2003. Uh, paper, um, but when we analyze the intact glycopeptide, we can tell that the intact peptide actually um, uh, present in the three uh, component of a, a spectrum. One spectrum actually um, are we call auxonimine, it's a, it's a fragment ion from the uh, carbohydrate. So that actually gives us a signature that that spectrum contains the glycopeptide. And the second um, signature are the peptide uh, fragment bind, which actually can be aligned uh, with our glycosylated peptide using the, um, the glycoside analysis method. And then uh, the um, additional uh, peak will be the peptide contain various different uh, glycans. So using this strategy, actually we develop uh, a software called uh, GPQuest to allow us to use uh, to choose the spectrum contained the auxonium ion, and then mesh the uh, peptide backbone to the uh, the peptide we identified, uh, you know, using the um, uh, fragment ion, and determine the uh, precursor mass uh, contained the glycan to allow us to sign the uh, the intact glycopeptide. So that the entire uh, approach actually described here is we conjugate the peptide, including glycopeptide, to solid phase um, in, to uh, release the glycan uh, for glycomics analysis, and uh, when uh, the, uh, the after release of glycan, the uh, expert uh, turn to isoparic acid can be further released by S uh, uh, proteinase to uh, uh, to allow us to identify the glycosylation site using the site and the uh, glycan to build a database to allow the um, GPQuest to assign the glycan to a specific glycosylation site. So this is approach actually we've been used uh, since we established for. Um, ending uh, glycoproteomic approach. Uh, as you can see, this is a still a uh, chemical enzymatic approach. In, in initially, uh, the, uh, the peptide are conjugated to the solid phase using chemical approach. Then uh, use, uh, after modification, enzymatic approach to release the glycan, and the, uh, the second enzymatic approach to release ending glycosylation site. So um, after we actually uh, uh, developed this uh, initial approach, we try to um Enter the question that uh, you know uh, the one of the project uh, funded by NSF to uh, determine the glycosylation of uh, antibody or glycoprotein expressed in CHO cells, uh, which is commonly used uh, for the uh, production of uh, um, the, uh, the glycoprotein drug. So uh, in this approach, uh, we uh, initially extract the protein, and uh, um, after uh, the peptide are fractionated, then um, uh, glycopeptide are enriched by the hydro, uh, helic um, uh, cartridge, and the glycopeptide are uh, basically released to peptide and the glycan, and uh, uh, analyzed by our trap to, de to determine the glycosylation site and the glycan as a database. And the second uh, part is uh, the intact peptide directly analyzed by mass spectrometry to sign the uh, specific glycosylation site. So in this approach, we try to investigate whether the glycosylation, uh, the peptide should be uh, fractionated, enriched first, fractionated, or enriched. Uh, fractionated or enriched. This is the original uh, investigation when we try to establish the uh, the phosphoproteomics approach. Uh, the the original approach will try uh, the in the phosphoproteomics approach. Uh, in, conclude that the uh, fractionation fo followed by uh, the uh, the MAC enrichment for phosphopeptide uh, turned out to give us a, a high yield of phosphoproteomics uh, coverage. So in this case, we actually tested two strategy. So as you can see that the enrichment 
followed by fractionation. Actually, in, in the glycopeptide, give us a slightly um, you know, uh, increased um, identification. In this case, we identify 43,000 uh, PSM. Glycopeptide assignment uh, spectrum versus um, in um, this uh, uh, glycopeptide um, uh, fraction, uh, total peptide fractionation followed by the peptide uh, glycopeptide enrichment give us a 28,000 uh, spectrum assignment. So, in, so we actually um, later on. Um, Adapt uh, the strategy used the uh, uh, fractionation, uh, the enrichment followed by fractionation as our uh, anti glycopeptide analysis uh, strategy. And the second question, uh, like often uh, came from our um, uh, collaborators in this case, is um, how much material do we need uh, to uh, do we need to start with uh, to in order to uh, uh, analyze the glycoproteomics? So if we start, we test the start with one microgram, a hundred microgram, or a three milligram level. In the one microgram, we can direct inject the sample to the pept to the mass spectrometer, and we generally identify 120 um, the PSM uh, for anti-glycopeptide. So if we enrich it first, then uh, anal by hyd uh, hydrophilic uh, column, uh, then analyze mass spec, we identify like, uh, you know fairly low number of uh, glycopeptide uh, spectrum. So this is the case. Um, we conclude that the glycopeptide uh, Analysis, glycoproteomic analysis, if it starts with a very low amount of a material, in this case, one microgram, direct analysis actually can give us a, a fairly, um, you know, a good coverage of a peptide uh, versus uh, enrichment could actually, uh, you know, uh, could due to the loss of the material during this process. If it starts with 100 microgram of a, a, a cell uh, proteins, so we can actually enrich by the helix cartridge, and then analyze um, the entire material by single shot LCMMS. So we identify roughly 1,000 um, the glycopeptide. Uh, then, if we without enrichment, the 100 microgram can be uh, in fractionated to 24 fractions, analyze uh, 24 fractions. So we totally uh, uh, yield identify over um, 1,400. Uh, earning uh, anti glycopeptide. So, in this uh, situation, if you have a 100 microgram of uh, uh, protein to start with, so uh, starting with uh, heating enrichment and uh, uh, analyze um, by single shot mass spectrum seems like a more efficient way to uh, invest uh, or analyze the glycoproteins. So, using the, um, the approach I described. Um, in the uh, previous uh, few slides, we analyzed the uh, Cho cell, cell lysine and the, uh, the uh, secreted medium to allow us to determine the, the protein uh, and the total proteins. And also, we separate uh, the protein in uh, carry different glycans. And uh, interestingly, like, the, um, you know, this is a single protein. Uh, we identify like 29 ending glycosylation site. We can determine the glycan uh, carried uh, by each uh, specific glycosylation site uh, in uh, medium versus in the cell lysis. So it allow us to investigate the in a uh, in a what we call the, the uh, glycoengineering when we um, modify the glycosylation enzyme in the uh, Cho cell. How the glycosylation uh, changes in the glyco in in the Cho cell, um, basically uh, to allow us to uh, modify our glycoform uh, that uh, we need to um, express in the Cho cell for uh, for the uh, for the drug um, production. So this is uh, uh, you know the workflow I described and application uh, for ending glycoproteomics. So recently we also uh, investigate the same strategy, similar strategy to ending glycoproteomics. Again, uh, we capture the uh, the digest the peptide to the um, to the uh, solid phase. So in this case, there's uh, recently uh, like release of uh, ending. Uh, glycosidase uh, operate, operator can uh, cut the N-terminal site of a uh, uh, type one, core one O-link uh, structure to release the glycan uh, with the peptide, allow us to uh, identify uh, the uh, O-link uh, glycopeptide with core one uh, glycan. Uh, so, uh, application of this method um, in uh, to um, 
kidney tissue, uh, old link proteomics serum, and T cell, we identify over, um, you know, uh, 4,800 uh, glycopeptide uh, from um, 34, um, over 3,400 uh, peptide, and uh, this is uh, represent over 3,000 precise uh, old link glycosylation site from over 1,000 glycoproteins. From the identified site, we can also investigate the uh, consensus glycosylation uh, motif. Uh, since we all know the N-link glycosylation contain uh, the NXT, NXS motif uh, to generally like the uh, N uh, followed by uh, adding amino acid, uh, like except the proline followed by serine screening is the consensus motif for O-link N-link glycosylation. O-link glycosylation generally we, mm, since they're totally so far only less than 2,000 only glycosylation site, site identified, so the consensus motif has not been investigated. Using the large number of only glycosylation sites we identified, so we investigate, uh, you know, showing that the uh, only glycosylation site are likely uh, surrounded by the proline, especially in the uh, plus three position and the minus one position. Uh, so this is the old uh, glycoprotein we identified from the study in terms of their um, in the cellular component, the location. So most of the protein, you can uh, see that it's under extracellular space uh, or, um, you know, ex uh, extracellular uh, region, um, et cetera. So, uh, as um, you know, um, any uh, work on the O-link um, uh, protein, we know the O-link protein actually is hard to analyze since the O-link uh, normally had very close O-link glyco uh, glycosylation. They actually space together to have a hundreds of a peptide, uh, hundreds of sites linked together without uh, proteinase uh, digestion site. So normally those are uh, heavily O-link site are invisible by mass spectrometry. But using this method, you can see that the, the uh, the uh, mucin, we can identify a number of sites close together since this is a, a enzyme can cut the uh, O link um, glycosylation from the, the, the peptide uh, portion to allow us to release the O link glycopeptide for mass spectrometry analysis. So, this, this is actually. Uh, conclude the end of the first topic I described uh, in the effort we will be working on to develop glycoproteomics workflow. And uh, um, the second topic I'm going to focus on change uh, to is uh, um, like the, um, the, the first uh, sentence, most of the, the introduction paper, uh, you know, in the glycoproteomics paper talk about glycosylation is one of the most common uh, protein modification, we'll see that uh, th in this topic we'll see the glycosylation is a very common protein modification. So this is uh, one of our uh, project uh, carrying in the group uh, in our uh, lab that uh, we actually work on a large number of uh, uh, tissue um, samples. So in this um, is supported by uh, Clinical Proteomics Tumor Analysis Consortium, uh, NCI. Uh, in each project, uh, for example, we, we just uh, complete the um, the ovarian cancer project uh, published 2016. Now we just finished our kidney cancer project. Uh, you know, the, basically we made the data available to the public, and uh, in each process we uh, analyze uh, generally 100 to 200 uh, tumor samples using the TMT-based strategy. For example, this, all the tumors, um, you know, basically digest to a peptide and label by uh, TMT mixed together. Uh, the mix of TMT. Uh, uh, are fractionated uh, by basic uh, reverse phase HPLC and to uh, 25 fractions for global proteomics. Uh, then uh, um, the, the fraction, uh, fractionated peptide also enrich for phospho uh, peptide for phospho proteomics. So this is a workflow. Each workflow, each sample, a uh, TMT set basically will analyze somewhere around like 30 to 40 uh, fractions. Um, for the uh, proteomic identification. Normally, in the global proteomic level, we identify uh, 10,000 protein from each TMT set, and the, fos uh, the fossil proteomics level we identify uh, uh, roughly uh, 40,000 40, phospho uh, peptide from each TMT set. So through this, uh, like, uh, 
project, since this project normally actually take a year at least uh, to acquire the, the entire data, we need to uh, determine the reproducibility of the data generally a year ago and a year later. And also um, th that we basically develop this called um, the a comparative reference material is a two uh, patient derived um, breast cancer tumor. One is a luminal, one is a basal uh, tumor. So they, uh, each sample we labeled uh, five times with uh, TMT uh, mixed together. Then we can actually determine the quantitation and identification, uh, you know, in space uh, in through the uh, entire uh, tumor uh, proteomics analysis. The second material we developed is uh, the NCI seven cells. So since this material is, uh, the xenograph come from both mouse and the human proteins. So uh, the mouse protein uh, generally will, um, also uh, could possibly dominate uh, the proteomics uh, if we mix them together into the TMT set. So we would like to develop a, a common uh, reference material we can uh, include in the TMT set to allow us to uh, determine uh, within the TMT reproducibility. Basically, we spike, uh, we put uh, one of the, uh, the channel uh, as uh, use NCI7 cell throughout the analysis to determine our reproducibility. And between the analysis, we include NCI, uh, the comrade material, with the xenograph material, to determine the within, um, you know, uh, large, uh, longitudinal um, reproducibility. So I want uh, uh, this before I uh, go into the uh, glyco uh, proteomics uh, work. I want to describe uh, briefly this the reference material we developed here uh, in the NCI seven cell. It was published uh, recently. We chose uh, seven cell line described here. The reason we choose uh, chose the seven cell line because uh, from genomic. Um, data, we can see e e each individual cell line allow us to cover uh, somewhat like 70 to 80 percent of the uh, uh, gene expression uh, from the entire NCI 60 um, g uh, genome. Uh, but mixture of the 96, uh, seven cell line allow us to cover 92 percent of the entire um, human, uh, the, the NCI 60 cell um, genome and uh, uh, roughly 88 percent of the entire human genome. So using this material, we actually expect to uh, allow us to cover most of the cancer uh, proteome or genome uh, to give us uh, the quantitative value for, um, for the uh, tumor proteomics analysis. So uh, this is a comparison of the, uh, of the two um, uh, uh, reference material. One is this uh, uh, comrade material from Xenograph. Generally, we identify 13,000 protein from mouse and human. Uh, and uh, identify roughly 9,600 uh, human proteins. In NCI7 cell, identify uh, roughly 11,000 uh, uh, proteins. Fossil proteomics level, um, you know, the, the, the NCI7 cell identify 50,000 phosphopeptide and 40,000 phosphopeptide from, uh, from the human um, proteins in um, Comref uh, xenograph material. So through this uh, analysis, we can tell NCI7 cell and the uh, um, xenograph uh, material, actually the, the both had um, uh, access, uh, advantage uh, and in the way that uh, NCI7 cell give you a better coverage of human uh, proteome, uh, the um, common reference material give us uh, 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 further coverage of uh, the um, uh, t uh, the tissue uh, stroma component or fibroblast component, since the cells actually does not have that uh, component, but the mouse uh, tissue provide the um, the stroma component to allow us to um, investigate um, those proteins which carried by the mouse tissue. But the only situation is the mouse tissue actually some um, protein are a unique uh, peptide for mouse only. So we have to actually investigate on the common and unique peptide for human and mouse. So those are the overlapping of uh, uh, proteomics and the phosphoproteomics. So through this analysis, you can see that we can sign roughly uh, 20 to 30 percent of the spectrum from global proteomics uh, to, to those peptides. Uh, but phosphoproteomics, we only can sign 12 percent of the spectrum to a phosphopeptide. So this indicated that this majority of uh, uh, 
the peptide or majority of spectrum during this analysis are not assigned to the um, global proteomics or photoproteomics. So uh, one of the um, actually investigation we want to uh, investigate whether this is a you know missing a sign uh, spectrum actually uh, are due to uh, other modifications. So we search um, you know our using our GPQuest software to search the uh, the same data with uh, for the glycopeptide uh, glycopeptide. We can see that we identify large number of uh, glycopeptide. For example, in global proteomics, we identify over uh, roughly three. 3,000 uh, PSM of a glyco, uh, glycopeptide, and in, in the photoproteomics, we identify over 10,000 uh, glycopeptide. So majority of the glycopeptide actually identified from the photopeptide are actually salic acid containing, which actually, um, you know, reasonable since uh, the mm, photopeptide enrichment is based on uh, the phosphate uh, negative charge uh, interaction with uh, uh, the iron metal uh, IMAT um, uh, material. So from this, uh, we we went back to uh, investigate uh, the paper published uh, in a CP tag from breast cancer uh, study in the Nature um, Nature um, in uh, for CP tag uh, tumor uh, proteomics. We can see that in a uh, uh, phosphopeptide, uh, this is each sample actually this is uh, each fractions of multiple samples. Each fraction, um, each sample actually represents the glyco the phosphopeptide versus the uh, this is each fraction actually. Each fraction, this is one sample with different fraction. Each fraction contains the phosphopeptide and the global peptide. We can see this phospho, the glycopeptide uh, closely resemble the the phosphopeptide enrichment. When when this uh, this peptide this fraction actually enriched by phospho, the glycopeptide uh, actually um, content also uh, increase. Except the three uh, fractions, uh, which we saw a high level of phosphopeptide, but not uh, glycopeptide. Uh, this is fractions. So this actually drove us uh, to investigate whether, uh, you know, since the phospho, um, phosphate group, uh, the PI uh, charge uh, ranges around two, the the phthalic acid or uh, the carboxy group is around three, so we would like to see whether this phenomena or we can use to further separate the phosphopeptide and glycopeptide to be uh, to to uh, to specific isolate <coughs> phosphoglyco. So this is this is a second uh, you know uh, this is experiment uh, done by Ryan uh, Cho in the group. So what he did is he set up a different pH for the uh, IMAT enrichment uh, and showing that uh, in uh, instrument with, uh, from pH 1 to pH 4, the, the IMAT uh, material can effectively enrich phosphopeptide um, in, in, with a pH 2 as an optimal um, pH for phosphopeptide enrichment. And this is a uh, phosphopeptide uh, Distribution in terms of uh, phosphoserum or screening or phosphotyrosine uh, in different pH, and uh, this is a different um, phospho uh, side containing uh, peptide uh, with a different pH. You can see in the lower pH, you can uh, enrich a higher level of uh, multiple phosphorylated peptide. For glycopeptide, you can see that uh, with different pH, so pH 3 actually uh, show the optimal enrichment um, for. Uh, Glycopeptide, but uh, you know, compared to what the phosphopeptide, you can tell that the glyco and the phosphopeptide, uh, in terms of pH um, distribution, they uh, they seem to quite overlap. So we basically could not use the pH to uh, specifically separate uh, the phospho enrichment from the glycopeptide. So also uh, this uh, result showing that uh, with uh, um, the the I met uh, enrichment with a different uh, pH. So the majority of enrichment uh, come from the salic acid containing peptide and uh, a neutral peptide, neutral gly glycan containing peptide, for example, oligomannose containing peptide are general low throughout all the all the pH. So this indicates to us that um, the Two things is one is the forceful enrichment using IMAT in regards to what pH cannot avoid to co-enrich the forceful uh, peptide, especially the static acid-containing peptide, and also the IMAT itself 
only partially enrich the phospho the glycopeptide, especially the negative charge that has a containing, but not the uh, gly the entire glycopeptide. So, so this actually um, promote us to uh, invest uh, this strategy to uh, determine if we want to do the glyco and the phospho, uh, you know. An analysis simultaneously. Do we uh, need to do uh, IMAN enrichment for glycopeptide? Since we know this is uh, not complete for glycopeptide, we have to follow um, the uh, flow through with uh, uh, helic or hydrophilic enrichment for um, glycopeptide enrichment. Or we should enrich the uh, glycopeptide first, followed by the uh, phos phosphoproteomics, uh, phosphopeptide enrichment. So this, this uh, experiment actually summarizes here. If we do the IMAP first, then we can see high level of phosphopeptide enrichment. Some uh, overlapping glycopeptide also co-enriched. And uh, follow uh, the flow through with um, the hydro hydrophilic enrichment, um, the uh, glycopeptide are further enriched. Uh, to, you know, combined together, we can see the phosphopeptide and glycopeptide are uh, fairly actually uh, enriched in this strategy. Reversely, if we do max enrichment first, we mainly uh, identify the, false, the glycopeptide, rarely um, contain the phosphopeptide in, in this enrichment, and the further uh, flow through further enrichment by IMAT uh, identify the phosphopeptide, but combined together, um, give us a fairly um, you know, equivalent uh, glycopeptide identification, but the less uh, number of phosphopeptide analysis. Further investment of this uh, phenomenon, we find that this uh, enrichment actually we also lost uh, the uh, the multiple phosphorylated peptide in this max followed by uh, IMAT enrichment. So the max, max actually we know is a, uh, has a three component of a, a matrix. One is a hydrophobic, hydrophilic, and a, a ion exchange. So this is strong ion exchange. So we thought this, is, this could be due to the, um, the multiple charge, the phosphopeptide still uh, you know, retain in the uh, strong ion exchange. So that's, that's why we had less enrich uh, or, or illusion of the phosphopeptide with uh, the strategy of, uh, mag, uh, using max for phosphopeptide for glycopeptide first followed by the phosphopeptide for, uh, followed by phosphopeptide analysis so with all this uh, uh, you know setup uh, actually uh, uh, Ryan uh, set up to analyze this two uh, xenograph uh, mouse model one is a uh, uh, basal like another luminal uh, for uh, glycophosphoproteomic analysis using the strategy uh, he just tested uh, I did presented just now so uh, labeled uh, five mice with a uh, uh, five of the TMT another uh, five uh, xeno uh, tumor with uh, um, uh, another five channel of TMT, combine them together, and the fractionated, uh, each fraction uh, first enriched by phosphopeptide, then you flow through, and enriched by uh, glycopeptide using the uh, hydrophilic uh, enrichment. And the entire analysis is done by uh, LCMS, by Lumos. I think uh, in this, uh, you know, data is showing uh, some biological uh, phenomena, which actually is interesting. Uh, one is like we sh saw um, previously, the, uh, this is uh, um, IMAD itself, enriched phosphor uh, with some of the glycopeptide co enrichment, further, um, you know, enrichment of a free flow through by hydrophilic in, uh, enrichment uh, can further enrich the rest of glycopeptide. And this is a total, uh, glycopeptide uh, and the phosphopeptide uh, identified and quantified through this strategy. And uh, in IMAC, you can see the, um, the neutral uh, glycan containing peptide like uh, oligomannose glycan and the other glycan um, are actually uh, uh, enriched uh, in a lower efficiency, uh, but um, uh, further can be further enriched uh, in the from the flow through by the hydrophilic uh, cartridge. So the, the oligomannose uh, glycopeptide and the uh, uh, other neutral glycan are enriched. So this phenomenon is showing that uh, in the, in the uh, identified glycopeptide, in terms of uh, what are the 
protein uh, or, or the glycoprotein identified from mouse. So we know in the xenograft tissue, you know, the mouse tissue, um, norm, no, mouse protein normally contribute to the to the fibroblast or the, the stromal component of the tumor. And uh, um, human uh, tissue, a uh, human protein come from the tumor cancer cell itself. So in, in this uh, data, you can see that in oligomannose uh, containing glycopatide, most come from human. That means most come from tumor cell itself. I mean, the elevated level of uh, oligomannose uh, in, in the luminal uh, cells, uh, proteins, in, in the xenograph tumor. In static acid, most come from the mouse protein. So that's actually from the fibroblast cell. So and the fucosylated actually uh, somewhere in the middle, and this is other glycans uh, not containing salic acid and fucose. There are most of neutral glycans. And uh, further, he investigated the protein up and down regulated in terms of component. And large number of protein up and down since the num large number of protein, uh, fossil protein identified. And showing that uh, compared to aluminum versus the basal uh, phenomena and the cell death uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, apoptosis, uh, et cetera, the protein uh, actually, uh, actually up uh, increase in the uh, in the uh, cells, um, in the, in the uh, luminal cells compared to basal. The, in the down regulation uh, of the protein uh, show in the uh, uh, blue, actually uh, show another uh, uh, you know, reverse uh, phenomenon, for example, cell uh, adhesion, <coughs> et cetera. Okay, uh, so uh, I'm gonna uh, come into the, uh, the, the um, the last topic is glycoproteomics analysis. Um, you know, uh, ovarian uh, tumor identified the glycosylation associated with uh, uh, tumor subtypes. So, in the ovarian uh, proteomics analysis, we have uh, analyzed uh, 108 tumor uh, uh, between. Uh, this we analyze the ComRef uh, material like I described just now, also include the NCI7 cells as our uh, common uh, material to uh, for quality control of a long-term uh, reproducibility, stability of system. The, each tumor actually isolated peptide and uh, uh, labeled by TMT and combined together. We did global proteomics glycoside analysis, basically the spec uh, method uh, I described initially, and this is anti-glycopeptide analysis. So uh, the, the protein and the glycoprotein identified, quantified. So this is uh, uh, the, uh, we, we base in the TMT as a, a quality control, uh, same ovarian tumor actually analyzed uh, 10 times throughout the t different TMT set, showing that uh, the spec of reproducibility is somewhere around 0 0.9 to 0 0 0.8 to 0 0.9, close to 0 0.9 or in terms of CV throughout, um, actually this is a year long of uh, acquisition of data. Uh, the anti-glycopeptide, um, the reproducibility quantification uh, uh, close to uh, 0 0.8 uh, in terms of reproducibility. So this this is basically uh, um, the entire uh, sample actually labeled by TMT before we do any glyco uh, enrichment, um, you know, or glycoside enrichment. The quantification also, you know, come into the quantification accuracy when the glycopeptide. Um, quantification with a TMT, since the glycopeptide, sometimes the glycan actually easily be break down uh, compared to the, um, the TMT reporter. So the intact glycopeptide generally had slightly lower reproducibility due to the, uh, the glycan, the fragile um, like nature of uh, intact glycopeptide. So uh, due to the time I'll summarize what we uh, observe from this analysis, this is the same 108 tumor also analyzed by genomics, including uh, copy number and uh, mutation and mRNA, um, RNA-seq. So I, I, you know, from RNA-seq data, we when we calculate, when we compare to the uh, global proteomics, so the correlation of the, uh, the mRNA to the protein is a 0.4, so fairly low in terms of RNA and the protein. So that's argued that why, you know, we cannot, we have to do proteomics, uh, you know, cannot use the RNA to derive the protein uh, abundance. And when we compare the protein to the glycosylation site, uh, you know, uh, quantification, the, the correlation is fairly high. So basically, you know, the, the correlation is very close to our reproducibility uh, in the uh, 
uh, same sample throughout the, throughout the analysis, 0.8. So this, this actually served the hypothesis originally when we developed this glycoside proteomics. We used the glycoside um, as a, a way uh, to determine the uh, total protein uh, abundance as a, um, a simplified uh, method for uh, glycoproteomics uh, by only focusing focusing on the few ending glycosylation site instead of analyzing the entire uh, protein or, or peptide, uh, especially in in, in serum glycoproteomics, that which give us a simplified uh, you know the content. So this actually data is showing that uh, interestingly, like the most of the protein and the glycosylation site quantitation actually fairly correlated. But the, look at the protein to the high oligomannose containing peptide, the correlation actually is fairly uh, bad, it's 0.5 or so. So this actually uh, in indicated the similar uh, data we show from the mouse stenogram study that in a tumor uh, we uh, you know, saw the um, variation of oligomannose uh, glyco, uh, glycosylation changes. So this is, but if we take out the oligomannose um, Protein from the lysosome. We know lysosome also con uh, it contain the oligomannose protein. That's uh, their structure, oligomannose uh, protein. The, this portion of uh, lysosome oligomannose protein, the correlation to the global protein actually is fairly high, 0.7 or so, 0.75 or so. In terms of comp complex peptide, the correlation 0.68 somewhere in the middle between oligomannose to the um, to the uh, the entire protein level. To uh, use the anti-glycopeptide to um, cluster the tumor, we can uh, see three uh, subtypes uh, can be observed. The, the three subtypes are uh, one uh, is a uh, uh, methangomal, which is uh, very stable throughout the uh, RA subtype, proteomic subtype. We published in the cell paper. We also observe this subtype is very uh, actually uh, stable subtype uh, methangomal, and uh, in, th in glycoproteomics, uh, like subtyping, we also uh, see the immunoreactive or uh, metabolic, me uh, metabolic uh, subgroup, in which represent the blue, and, uh, and the, um, the first uh, green group is a uh, uh, differentiated uh, subgroup. So this actually can be also represent uh, fairly uh, consistently <coughs> by the, uh, the spec analysis. By global analysis, the first two groups are still conserved. Um, then the last group actually spread out to other um, types, uh, including the um, unknown group or, or uh, proliferative group uh, uh, combined into the third uh, the glycoproteomic subtypes. And this is a, a, the, the, this group uh, is a cluster by MRA. So MRA had a five group, but the mesenchymal group uh, stay consistent uh, with the global and the glyco. And the proliferative group, uh, differentiated group, actually is a mixture of uh, um, um, uh, with unknown uh, subgroup. But if we look at the three uh, subgroup, uh, subtype of tumor, ovarian tumor, uh, subclustered uh, by the anti-glycopeptide, we can see the differentiated group are uh, high. Uh, the salic acid is hardly expressed compared to the other two um, glycan forms. And in a methangomal group, the salic acid and the fucosylated form uh, uh, glycans are uh, increased. But in the um, immune uh, reactive group, the um, oligomanos, the, the, uh, the oligomanos group, uh, the glycoprotein are increased uh, compared to the uh, other um, glycan form. I think uh, there is time. Uh, this is a. Um, this is actually um, the summary of what I uh, talked today. Basically, we established a global uh, glycoproteomics, photoproteomics uh, workflow. Um, uh, the, uh, the, the entire approach uh, itself, um, recently, this is a part of the CP type uh, kind of a standard workflow. So there are three PCC, protein, we call protein uh, characterization center, three PCC standardize uh, the same procedure and, uh, and uh, show the reproducibility uh, of the workflow. Uh, and uh, the, the workflow actually um, been tested by the COMREF material as well as NCI7 cell material. So in this, in, the, in this two material and plus the protocol, uh, when we go to the uh, Hupo in uh, Orlando, we're actually, we'll 
organized uh, the, the cancer HPP. So I'm the cancer HPP chair since 2012. So that one of the effort, uh, there's an international uh, you know, called uh, Moonshot, or, or, you, or you can say the International Cancer Podomics Consortium. Um, different uh, country actually contribute their uh, tumor analysis. would like to uh, see whether there's a possibility to unite the protocol with a common standard, then um, the data generated from the different tumor type and different uh, you know, population can be used to compare to each other to uh, available uh, to the uh, general public uh, instead of, uh, you know, doing the duplicate work uh, throughout the uh, very expensive uh, approach, like uh, here, uh, funded by NCI. But the other countries also uh, involved uh, or uh, invested a huge amount of money for the uh, tumor uh, cancer proteomics. That likely, hopefully, uh, we can use the protocol plus the common uh, reference material to unite the a study together to allow the data uh, useful and commonly uh, available um, to compare to each other. And um, from uh, the second part of the talk, uh, what, I, um, what we conclude that uh, we observe a large number of glycopeptide, even from global proteomics, especially from fossil proteomics. So we actually investigate how do we separate, or we cannot separate how do we maximize our analysis of a global and the false, uh, you know, glyco and the uh, fossil proteomics uh, using the uh, workflow established uh, for the overall PTM analysis. And uh, um, this is what I mentioned. Then lastly, uh, we find the glycoprotein uh, heterogeneity was one of the major contributions of tumor subtypes, uh, you know, demonstrated in a, a ovarian uh, tumor uh, proteomics analysis. So I want to acknowledge uh, people in our group who would uh, investigate, uh, like, um, who actually contribute majorly on uh, proteomics uh, or glycoproteomics uh, method development. Um, Puni Xia um, and uh, Wei Ming actually uh, published the first anti-glycopeptide um, um, paper in 2014, and uh, followed by Shi Sheng published in 2016, uh, integrated global uh, uh, glyco uh, glycomics uh, inter uh, glyco pipeline analysis in 2016 Nature Biotech. Jake actually um, published uh, several papers on glycomics, which actually used the initial step to uh, conjugate the protein and release the glycan for glycomics analysis. And Shady, uh, she's not in the picture. She's actually the major person to invest uh, and work on the software development GP Quest, and, uh, and uh, as well as a Puni uh, as well. So uh, this is uh, the picture we took uh, like uh, five years ago. That time we we're majorly working on the technology development. Recently, um, the uh, work mainly uh, focused on the uh, the CP Tech project um, by uh, David Clark and uh, Jim Bo and uh, uh, Mike uh, for data acquisition. Um, uh, uh, Li Jun for sample preparation and uh, um, data analysis uh, by Jimbo and Mike Duo, and uh, Gang Long is involved in the Chou Sao um, glycoproteomics. I think uh, I want to um, acknowledge our funding support of the project, mainly uh, technology development for glycoproteomics funded by glycoprotom for the uh, funded by NHLBI Programs Excellence in Glyco Science, which has ended this year. So we basically, uh, for the last seven years, we focus quite a bit on glycoproteomic technology development supported by this project, and the uh, ovarian cancer project supported by NCI CB Tech and the Chosa projects supported by NSF. And I didn't, uh, I deleted the EDRM project, mainly focused on the, uh, the glycosylation enzyme uh, funded by NCI Early Detection Research Network. And uh, um, we have another project I didn't get a chance to talk about. Uh, it's a HIV um, related project uh, funded by NIAID. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hui, for that very informative talk. Um, the floor is open for questions. Do we have questions? Oh, it's very nice, very nice. Um, every serine threonine tyrosine can be either phosphorylated or glycosylated. Um, what was the overlap in a particular serine threonine tyrosine? Could a phosphocyte also 
at another time be glycosylate and vice versa? Um, so in, in this, our olding uh, proteomics analysis is uh, uh, like a galnac um, proteomics. It's not a uh, group neck. So the overlapping are, an, uh, are very sparse, very rare. Uh, in a different compartment, our holding uh, protein are extracellular compartment. The the phosphorylation normally happen in an intracellular protein. So that that actually reason very long. Your questions. Oh, wow. Yes. Yeah, you can you can yell right. <laughs> Actually, uh, you know, our workflow is uh, to have the um, triptypeptide fractionated uh, to 24 fraction first. Then we enrich uh, each fraction with uh, uh, IMAT and uh, uh, intact peptide analysis. So in this strategy, the, all the fractions are actually uh, contain the phospho uh, and the uh, Glycopeptide, but seeing that, seeing that, but our strategy uses a concatenated approach because we actually, in the basic reverse phase of 96 uh, fractions, we, uh, you know, basically combine them in the 24. So that could actually mix them to different fractions. That's possible. Actually, we didn't actually investigate that yet. No. Right. So following that question, have you also looked at other enrichment strategies for glycoproteomics in general, like uh, lectin and also um, these uh, uh, more recent, like the boronic acid, to compare there? Right. So we, we actually uh, did try lectin and the boronic acid. So in uh, lectin case, uh, we generally uh, can enrich, but normally the uh, glycopeptide uh, enrichment uh, normally represent 30 percent of the total PSM. So we can we normally had to we published a paper 2017 about the strategy to to do the lactin itself. We find that we do the lactin, then give us the, some uh, glycan specificity, but followed by hydro hydrophilic uh, interaction, then further further enrich the glycopeptide there. So the boronic actually, actually, uh, you know, I know Rong Hu who recently, yeah. uh, you know, investigated this uh, phenol, phenol group of uh, uh, boronic acid. The boronic acid approach in our group, we we try few, but never worked uh, <laughs> actually effectively. But we should investigate this uh, the recent his recent nature communication uh, like boronic acid. Uh, so we'll see what result look like. Any other? Questions? I guess we're ready for, for dinner. For dinner. <laughs> but don't, don't leave yet. Um, uh, thank you. It's lovely. Thank talk. you. Yeah. Okay, so before dinner, as we have a few minutes, dinner will be served at 6 30 and it's going to be right behind us. Um, I would like to take the few minutes that we have, since we wrapped up a little bit earlier, to uh, announce the um, results of the poster award. So I would just say that. Um, I was really impressed with all the posters and the sort of vigor of the of the poster session we had. And my only regret is that we were only able to have them up for a little over two hours. I, I think if we if we pull this together next year, I'm going to figure out how to leave those posters up longer because um, it really created a lot of discussion and it was great to see what everybody's doing. So I want to thank you all for participating. And I know that when I asked you all to participate, a lot of people said, do I have to present a poster? And the logic was, I want um, everybody to be able to talk about what they do, and I want us to sort of build a community. And so I really thought we achieved that. And um, to make it fun and to, to try to, uh, to honor some of the, um, the posters, we, we had um, a, a group of students that, um, that weren't presenting posters, that uh, weren't registered for the class, um, evaluate uh, the posters, and they, they were all very good. And they had a really tough time. But I said, well, I only have enough money to buy three Amazon gift cards, so you have to pick the best three. So they did. They, they said, can we have more? And I said, no, it's all I, I can only afford a three. So um, I want to go ahead and, and announce the, the, the three that were chosen. Um, and we'll start with a poster. I'm going to read the title of the poster so that um, 
So the, and then and then uh, we'll, we'll, so the poster was titled "Volatile and Non-Volatile Oxylipins Regulate Systemic Defense Against Insects and Maize," and it was by Eli Borrego from Texas A&M. Come on up, Eli. Is he here? <laughs> well, we'll go with number no. <laughs> That's a bummer. I <laughs> uh, didn't clarify that. Um, I should have had a, 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 a next choice here. Okay, uh, hopefully the next one's here. Um, title is A Chemical Ecosystem Selection Approach for Generating Evolvable Chemical Systems in Vitro by Lena Vincent from UW-Madison. Lena. <laughs> Lena is not from my group, or uh, what, is Lena here? Wow, what are the odds? I need a new list. <laughs> well, now, if we don't have this last one, I just don't know what to do. Um, <laughs> Did anybody see those two posters? I mean, is, is this a joke or something? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, third pitch here. Um, maternal NR supplementation during lactation promotes NAD metabolites for milk production and neo neonatal development by Pohin Ear from University of Iowa. <laughs> to take a photo. <laughs> All right, so what to do with the other two gift cards? Let me think on that over dinner. <laughs> Seriously. Uh, so, um, so the dinner's gonna be right behind us, so uh, we'll have 10, 15 minutes to relax, and then we'll, uh, we'll enjoy the dinner, and then we'll come in here for our final closing lecture, uh, and, and we'll end the night with an open bar. <laughs>